Shirley Adams of The Sewing Connection. Welcome back to Program 1 in Series 14. I've been traveling since we were last together and my sewing is influenced by everything I see and the wonderfully talented people I meet everywhere. These people come from many disciplines including not only sewing, but also quilting and weaving, wearable art, and such things as painting and dyeing, or maybe knitting or beading and anything else that might go into beautiful things to wear. We're going to see a fantastic parade of these throughout the programs. Many of you have said you don't really need any more clothes, but you just love to sew. Well, I'm interpreting that you don't want anything ordinary, so we won't bother with the humdrum. This is going to be a wake up and live time. We'll start out with a big celebration that began down in Houston. And what it began was with the idea for this suit I'm wearing. Do you think I embroidered all this? Well, I could have, and so could you, if you have a machine that will embroider. For instance, this looks very much like a couple of things that I've done already. Uh, this collar that I have here, it's a clip-on collar, or this uh, bag, this little clutch bag. Those flowers look almost identical, but they weren't. Uh, let me show you, though, how easy this is in case your machine does embroider. I'll just push the button and continue with this and let it do its thing until it uh, completes the flower. Now, what this flower is that's embroidering right now is from an Australian memory card, which is fun because the Olympics are coming up and uh, we're going to see a lot of things Australian uh, between now and then, uh, since that's the next place they'll be. So this is an Australian wildflower. I'm anxious to get over there and see what it looks like in reality. Instead of the colors that they recommended on the memory card, I'm doing mine in silver because, as I said, it's this big celebration, so uh, we're doing everything in silver now. And uh, where these actually came from, those that you already saw on the bag and the collar, they came from another memory card that just has a lot of big flowers. And it struck me as I saw these flowers that I'm wearing that, oh my, that looks like something I could have done at home. It looks very, very similar, and yet it's not. Well, that'll just take another minute and it'll then stop, so we'll let it go. And let's come over here and I'll show you where I did actually get this. Let me start out by saying where I got the suit pattern because it isn't uh, just any old pattern. It is one that I have made, and this was the start of it. Uh, it was a patterner, a basic patterner, so here I have my bond fit, and what unit I have on it is the one with the dart here at the waist, because this can all change, and you can put various units on, I'll show you next week how you can do some of that. But for right now, I've used that, and yet, instead of cutting it out just this way, I made it a little larger for one thing, because it's a suit. So I opened some knobs and brought it out a little bit wider, and uh, I pretended, instead of the size I am, that I'm actually about a size and a half bigger. And this is what I usually do when I want to uh, make a a suit because I'm going to wear perhaps a blouse or something else under it and so I want it to be a little larger so I started out like that and then I went beyond I folded my pattern tracer here so that uh, I would cut a facing at the same time as I cut everything else so here is the jacket just as it was and to that I have added a little button stand in front and so this is the suit nothing much has changed about it and uh, I cut it a little wider in the shoulders, too, because I am going to put pads in it and so on. So little changes like that, they can be made easily. But then what I did beyond that is cut it off right here. I folded this under, actually, to cut it because I just wanted this suit to come down to the waist. And then that lower part that I now have folded under, that's where this waistband came from. It was a matter of taking this dart at the waist and just folding it out. Uh, it did finish over there, the flower. Folded that out and cut off this much of it, and it curves then a little bit when you fold out the dart. And so that's where the waistband came from, and I just cut the front and back band all in one piece so there's only a seam in back. But it's so easy to make those little minor pattern changes and come out with something you like. Well, what I actually have here is, and what I am celebrating, is weddings. Not a wedding in our family, not even a wedding I'm going to, but what I saw down in Houston were some panels of uh, this beautiful embroidery. 
and I'm told they were from wedding kimono. And I guess the custom, or at least these, uh, had been rented many times for the bride to wear and returned and cleaned. And uh, then they were just cut apart when they were no longer wearable as dresses, as kimono. Uh, when they were no longer wearable, they were cut up and sold as these panels, which you can frame and put on a wall, and they're very pretty as they are. Well, the one I bought two of them. Here's one of them that I haven't cut up yet, and the one I'm wearing is cut. But what I decided about this, I like this one the best, and yet uh, the fabric was absolutely terrible that it was on because it had been worn. Here's the remains of that fabric. And you can see it really looks bad. And so all I wanted from it was the embroidery. So you don't just suddenly get your scissors and start cutting around here and then wonder, well, what am I going to do with this? You plan it very carefully first so that you don't make any mistakes because it's not replaceable. You have to do it right the first time. So I wanted to practice and I wanted to think about it. So I decided, well, the smartest thing to do here is to get two layers of wax paper. Uh, there was going to be a lot to, I've got a lot of flowers here. I only wanted to trace them once. And so I got two layers of wax paper. I was giving myself a second chance in case I didn't like what I did with it the first time. And so I traced it. You can see this was the top layer because my pen lines are still on this. This was the second layer. And all you can see of this second layer, maybe if I put it down here on the darker gray, you can see that it's just sort of rubbed in the wax. This is why wax paper might be a good uh, thing to use because you just sort of scrape the wax a little bit and you can see the impressions. Well, what I wanted this tracing for is because I wanted to see, now obviously the panel is longer than the jacket. I couldn't use it in its entirety. So I wanted to cut it up in some ways and I wanted to practice on this wax paper. How was I going to cut it? So the way I ended up cutting it is uh, parts of it here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I cut groupings of it wherever it was. And this one I can see is upside down. I think this flower is now up here and bent over sideways. And so it has been detached from the rest of it. These may be, I don't know, not, being, uh, not looking in a mirror right now. I don't know where they are. But here are some of the other pieces. So it was just cut apart wherever it seemed uh, like a good place to cut. Uh, because I wanted to do whatever with it. For instance, one of these, and I'm trying to find which one, was the waist. And why I wanted this down here is because there was a leaf here, but then it just sort of trailed back and forth and off. And I thought, well, I can't cut that up just the way it is. I'm going to have to actually stitch that on machine, just blend in my silver stitching there. So it does look like it was done on this fabric instead of being an applique. Uh, and so you think about it, and you might want to practice. Well, the way I practiced was to, first of all, just get some flowered fabric, uh, just a piece of cotton that I have here, because I wanted to see how I could applique the edge of that flower down to my suit. So what I've done, first of all, is put some a fusible web on the back of it with the release sheet, the peel-off paper there. And then I cut out one flower, and peeled off the paper and fused it to another piece of fabric. This was my rehearsal here. And what I did here is use green thread. And I was trying out different stitches on the machine to see which was going to blend best and which was going to look nicest in appliquing that down. So let's go over to the machine and do a little of that applique. And I'll just show you some of the choices that you have. I'll take, oh, is this a pretty flower? Doesn't that put you in the mood to maybe take that trip to Australia? Well, you have a while to think about it. The Olympics aren't going to be for a while, unless you want to get ahead of the crowds and go a little early. Uh, you might just do that. But I'll just get this out. Better cut it off. Isn't that pretty? I just love what those automatic embroidery things will do. And just fantastic things that, as you see, you walk away from it and it doesn't matter a bit. But let's go to the menu and see what we can do about some applique now. So if I just push the menu button, and then I want to get back to ordinary sewing, and then I have some choices here. There may be three different stitches I'm looking at that I want to consider really for appliqueing this. One of them is just a standard zigzag here, just maybe put closer together so that it blends in with the silver stitching that's there. 
And then there are a couple of blending stitches down here that I'm interested in. And one of them is smooth on one side and sort of goes back and forth on the other. And the other stitch goes in and out on both sides so it blends so you don't see a definite line. I'd like to try them all to see how they work best. You know, you better practice on this to make sure you know what you're doing. So it's a good idea not only to have it in a hoop, but if I'm going to do a lot of stitching, even though it's fused together, I probably want to have a little stabilizer on the back of it so that it will hold it out nice and straight even after the hoop comes out. And uh, once I have this in here and have the foot down and I want to start out with this uh, zigzag stitch, but I want it closer together. So I'll push that and I'll bring it down here as, uh, how small? Oh, about five. Let's try 0.5 and see what that does. Now, mainly what I want to practice here is I'm thinking, what direction does this actually need to go in? Because notice how on these flowers, see how all the stitching that's here is going back and forth like this? And if you would suddenly do some stitching a different direction, it'd really show and you don't want that. You want it to go right with the threads that are already there so it blends in, so it doesn't look like it's appliqued. And uh, this is what I'm going to practice now. Well, I have, of course, no threads here already. So typically, this is what you would do if you're going to be doing some stitching. So uh, if I would do this applique, here's a little trick I found out. You know, I told you I've been traveling a lot. And this one is just standard zigzag. So see how I'm moving it back and forth a little bit? This is a little trick I found out from uh, Sherry Dawn Roberts in my travels. She's from Kentucky, but she teaches all over the nation, maybe all over the world. And uh, thread painting, that type of thing is what she does. And she said, anytime you're doing a leaf, you want to be doing your zigzag so that it's pointing out to the point of the leaf. And that is a very good point because it really does blend in nicely. So you can see I'm going over the edge of the uh, and I think I'll push this manual so that I see a little of my white bobbin thread coming up, which you certainly don't want. And so to get rid of that, I've pushed the manual key here, and I'm going to lighten the tension on the upper thread. Oh, about that much. Let's see what it does, because I don't want to see any of that white. So it's another good reason to practice to see what's happening to make sure that uh, none of it will happen once you get to your good project. But do move this back and forth as I'm doing here because if you just uh, keep it straight, then it'll be too definite an edge and it'll show. It'll stand out. So now I'm coming back down under the leaf and seeing what it'll do there. And if you need some more, then just go back over a place. It doesn't matter. And. Uh, so right now I had nothing to contend with and so this was a good place to start. I want this needle down position and I'll just push the needle down over here too so that every time I stop the needle will come to the down position so that I won't have to keep pushing the temporary down over here. What I wanted to do with the needle down is uh, lift the presser foot and turn it. But there are times when you need to use both your hands and what I really should have had on the machine is the little... Uh, knee control because that makes it so much easier. So here's the knee control and I'm going to put it on. And with that knee control in place, then if I need both my hands up here, and I better get rid of this thread I have started, then if I need both my hands up here, I can just push the knee control or the knee uh, lift, the knee lift here so that I can rotate and go in another direction because now I have a leaf that points out this way. So right in the joining between the two leaves is where I would want to rotate it and uh, start going the other direction. And here again, you know, kind of blend in however it needs to be, but move it back and forth. Well, I like the way this is working pretty well, but let's see what the other stitches are because they may be better. Until you try them, you don't know because everything is a separate case and it must be tried. So the other one, I'm going to have to uh, once again go back to the menu and I'll remember where I am on this as far as the tension goes because the tension will be uh, different once I go back there. And at the menu, I'm going to go to, still in the ordinary sewing, but the extension of it, the larger numbers, because I want to go way down here to number 124. So I'll just keep pressing this until I get to that grouping. And uh, here we are. So 124, this is the one 
it's a shading stitch, it's a blending stitch, and it's all even on one side, even though the other side goes back and forth. So let's see what would happen if I would just leave it here and not move that back and forth, but just work my way down the leaf. What will happen is the outer edge, the right edge of this, over on this side, will be smooth, and the inner edge will be blending. And as I do this, I also will see, do I need to change the thread tension again? And yes, I do, I'm seeing white. So I'll again go to manual and get the tension down lighter because different fabrics, different threads are just going to react different ways. Ordinarily, this happens automatically, but when you use some unusual things, then you have to allow for it. Okay, now I'm going to lift again and pivot that slightly so I can get out to another little point of this leaf. And uh, take a good look, and as I look at this, I am seeing, and I'll just get it up here so that I can move it off. As I look at this, it looks like this automatic straight edge here probably doesn't work quite as well as the one where I was manipulating it back and forth a little bit. You don't know that until you try it. So it was a good thing to try it. But there's still another stitch there that I didn't try. Let's just go to the next one and try 125 and see about that shading stitch. I'll just jump down the leaf here a little bit and see what this one looks like. Now this is one that's irregular on both sides. It goes narrow and wide and just keeps moving. So we'll see what this one does. And if this one is to our liking, maybe this is the one that we'll use. And uh, again, I'm going to do the manual and lessen the tension on the top thread. And uh, well, it's a good thing I tried it, but I still like the first choice best. So with three choices, you can't beat that, can you? One of those is bound to be just great. Okay, well this is how I would applique when I don't have any threads there to go along with. On this one, however, I had definite threads. And just as I have in these, which are very similar, you can see that these are definite threads and you have to blend in. So on this one, for instance, instead of going to the point of the leaf, instead of doing the zigzag, uh, how would that be pointing to parallel with the point of the leaf? What I want to do here is just manipulate it however it needs to be so that it will uh, blend in. Well, what's a little bit different about the leaves I'm going to be appliquing than those that I was appliquing before is the fact that it does have these definite thread lines. So what I'm concerned about is this very smooth edge here, and yet if I would do a smooth satin stitch there, it'd show, there'd be a ridge around the edge. So I've decided for this, the best thing is that stitch, 124 it was, where it had a smooth edge and the rest of it blended. So this is what I'm going to do. I'll just try this on, uh, some fabric here that's in a hoop and see how it works out. Even though it doesn't have a leaf there, I just want to try it out to uh, check it. And let's see, I need that to be 124 instead of 125. And again, I'm going to loosen the pressure on, so the silver shows. And let's see what this looks like. Now we're pretending there's a leaf already done in here. And uh, what I would do is just very slowly move this with the leaf and what I'm going to have is a smooth edge, and yet that smooth edge would blend into the leaf if I had that, uh, that one under here. So let me cut it so I can move it off. And uh, you can see how one edge of it is now just very smooth, but the other edge is very indefinite. So this is what you want, but you don't know that until you try things out. Try all those machine possibilities and see what will happen. Well, what we were celebrating with this was uh, weddings, and I hope all those people who wore this kimono are living happily ever after. In the meantime, I really need John to take me someplace spectacular to wear this suit. Uh, but there's something else I'd like to show you because we're celebrating more than this wedding. We are also celebrating life. I said that I met all this down in uh, Houston, or this is where it started. Well, I want you to look at the model now and see what else I saw down in Houston. As I was ready to make my pink and silver suit, I ran into Joanne Musso, who was modeling hers in a fashion show. And what hers was was a celebration of life. What has happened is that, oh, about uh, uh, several years ago, Joanne discovered that she had breast cancer. And so uh, it was a long battle over many years, but she made this pink suit to celebrate 
her fifth year. Uh, so she is a survivor. By now it's celebrating her sixth year because she made this about a year ago. And I'm so pleased that everything has worked out so well. Well, anyway, what Joanne did on this wonderful suit is uh, she also used a pink crepe and she has a lot of silver thread. And notice how this silver thread is all uh, channel quilted. It's oh, about a, a quarter inch apart. So for this you'd use your quarter inch foot to get a really nice even line. Once you get that first line done, the rest of them then would just be parallel. She admitted that took about nine hours and uh, she just enjoyed doing it and she said it was well worth it and it doesn't have to be a continuous nine hours. You can come and go on it. But anyway, this is what she did first of all. And then she decided to go up to the shoulders and do a little bit of other things. And these shoulders are hand embroidered with ribbon floss and some rat tail and some embroidery thread and there are beads and handmade flowers and then some machine embroidered leaves and little yo-yos that were beaded in uh, sequin flowers. Uh, so it's really elaborate up there on the shoulders and this is typical. You kind of like to bring the attention up toward your face so to do shoulder uh, decor is one of the most uh, usual ways to do it. And then notice how the jacket is edged with gray braid and the pants and the blouse are silver crepe back satin uh, used on the wrong side to get just the right shade of gray. And the reason she did that was this was, this was in memory of those five kind of hard years, tough years that she spent waiting for this fifth year anniversary. And uh, that gray is just uh, the right shade of gray to say that yes, there were some kind of shady times, some kind of uh, sad times as she was waiting. Well, anyway, it's gone six years by now and she's in really good health and she has a wonderful life to celebrate. So this celebration in pink is what uh, it's all about. Now I have this letter and this jacket not only from Joanne, but I have a lot of letters that I get from people. A lot of people seem to watch my show as they're recovering from whatever. They must run uh, public television in hospitals all the time. But I get a lot of letters from them with similar stories. And I want to urge you to please don't get to the state where if there is going to be anything, where it's going to be a really a tough problem please detect anything like this early. And the ways are obvious. You see public service announcement all the time. So it's obvious how you can detect it very early with self-examination, with uh, mammograms to catch anything before it really goes to that point. Well, some other things on the suit that I'm wearing that I want to show you. Uh, one thing, for instance, it looked a little unfinished, just, just ending it with seams around the edges. So what I've done with this is, uh, and I'll go over to the table to show you some other things I have. What I've done with this is, as I uh, uh, looked uh, through my stash, I found that I had the exact shade of pink. And this is in a crepe back satin, so it's shiny, it's a silk, really. And uh, I decided that would be just right for a piping around the edge to finish it up. And also I used this for loop buttonholes in. And what I was just delighted to find, uh, notice how the flowers here in the center, those little centers of all these flowers, you can see those cross threads just going back and forth. And uh, to make that little ball, I found in my stash, I didn't even have to go out and buy this, in my stash I found these buttons that look exactly like the center of those flowers. So how perfect, you know, everything comes together eventually. It all works out just right if you just uh, keep collecting all those things in your collection. So I put the piping and I put all the button loops on and then the waistline seam because I put that uh, little uh, band around the bottom and that waistline seam still looked a little oh unfinished. So I thought I've got more of that piping I can make. Let's cover up the seam by putting some piping around there. In fact, how about a double row of it? And uh, with this uh, cording really I've covered it. And uh, I had a few extra buttons. So one of them is here to button on to. And then a couple more are here. I didn't want to cover up this. You have to think carefully about that wonderful um, grouping of flowers that you have. And you don't want to cover anything unnecessarily. So I wanted to leave this blank since I have this flower here. And I therefore then just put a couple of buttons over here for the rest of the belt as it goes around to fasten to or begin under. 
I started to say something about this blending earlier, and now you can see what I'm talking about after I showed that on the pink flower, uh, on the multicolor, the flowered fabric. You can see how I was going back and forth. Well, this is what I did down here in order to blend it in, because I definitely there didn't want a hard line around the edge. Uh, so you just work with it and it's, it's amazing what you can do. Now I don't know what my plans are for this other one, uh, but something good will come of it because this fabric also isn't terribly pretty. Uh, it's been through the mill and so I don't know that I want to frame this other panel, but I'm going to do something with it eventually. All I have left over from the one that I'm wearing is this. Somehow I neglected to use these and uh, that's all. Every bit of it I uh, did use, but you have to plan carefully to do that, to get it all together and uh, make sure that things work out just right. Buy a little experimentation, buy a little practice, by doing whatever it takes to do the job just right when it's something this special. Well, that was a special uh, program in that I'm so thrilled that everything is good with Joanne. Uh, so here's to Joanne and all the other Joannes out there who have gone through maybe a rough time and uh, let them urge you to get that mammogram real quickly. It's easy, just go do it. But in the matter of ease, how much do you need, for instance, to add for a blouse or a jacket or any other garment? Join me next time and we'll find out just how this is done. Thank you.